It's the 90s and you want to play your video games anywhere you go. So you tell your mom, hey, I want a Game Boy. And she goes, no. So what do you get instead? Probably a Tiger Electronic handheld LCD game. They were nowhere near the same league as a Game Boy, or even Sega Game Gear for that matter. But to a parent who desperately wanted to quiet their kid, they were the perfect alternative. Why? Well, it wasn't because they were good. It was because they were cheap. They were shallow gameplay experiences. When you played one, you felt like someone scammed you. Tiger released handfuls of these things using any popular franchise from sports to movies and even MC Hammer. But what caused young Shane particular offense was when they took popular video games I knew and loved and turned them into this. Bring this to the schoolyard and the other kids would set fire to it after they beat you up. Then in 1995, Tiger released the R-Zone system, an attempt to ride the hype of the surefire success that would be the Nintendo Virtual Boy. It took their LCD game format that we knew and hated and introduced cartridges, switching out the screen for each different game. The best part is you strapped it to your face. C can we place the R-Zone over the camera right now? Yeah, 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 right there, right there. Bring it down, there you go. <laughs> See this? This was not a game! They later made a handheld version of the R-Zone, but the games were still awful, and they still played like this. Okay, okay, I'm getting a headache, get rid of it. Ugh. Nobody liked the R-Zone, which was a blow to Tiger's already not so great name. Oh, they were down, but they were far from being out. They took one more shot at making their own video game console. And in 1997, eight years into the Game Boy's domination of the handheld gaming market, Tiger released their most ambitious project yet. It would be modern, edgy, and have all the games the kids wanted, plus more. I have a surprise for all the slackers, but nothing better to do than play games and surf the net all day. Game Con! You heard him right, slackers. Today we're talking about the Tiger Game Con. It surfed the net. It had a touchscreen. Its game spoke. Let's see Nintendo do that. And then the games? And it plays more games than you idiots have brain cells. <laughs> oh, don't worry, we'll get to that. But first, we have to discuss this console's name. It's spelled Game.com, tapping into the mystique of the web and positioning the device as a slick, high-tech marvel. But the dot is silent. It's called Gamecom, and don't you forget it. Gamecom active. With a name like that, you'd think you were bringing home an internet-capable device. Well, guess again. The Gamecom console was $69.99, but to get online, you had to double that money to throw in the mandatory modem and internet cartridge, not to mention subscribing to a compatible internet service provider. You know, a thing very few people had back in the mid-90s. It wasn't even capable of loading any images or graphics. All of this just to read and send emails. That's totally what gamers were after. But included in the Gamecom for no extra money were cool features the Game Boy didn't offer, like a phone book, a calendar, calculator, and, and a built-in solitaire game. This is sounding like an office assistant, not a game console. So far, this is more geared towards business folks and not high schoolers. Probably why they threw in the whole touchscreen angle. Thanks to be touched! Well, that sure is a line someone wrote in a commercial aimed at minors. Sure, in 1997, it seemed really cool that Gamecom had a 3.5 inch touchscreen and stylus, but it doesn't get you anywhere. The majority of games don't even use it in any significant way. It's mostly important for the built-in apps like the phone book and solitaire. The face buttons are fine, but the floaty shield D-pad thing, that's gotta go. It feels soft and unresponsive, removing all feeling of control. Then there's the major unique feature of Gamecom, the touchscreen. Now it functions with a supplied stylus that would have gone right here, but ours was lost before we got it. But it's no trouble, your finger works perfectly fine. Typically, with portable video game consoles, you have a cartridge slot to put in a single cartridge into the system. But Gamecom had to do things better than Game Boy and Game Gear, so you've got two cartridge slots. You can only ever play one game, so having two workable cartridge slots makes no sense. Maybe in the future they were going to make some really cool double cartridge games, 
but that never happened. To add to the challenge of playing this thing, our Gamecom screen is kind of busted, so that's fun. Probably from one of the too many intense games of Solitaire, I think. And the screen is grayscale with no backlight. The more the image moves, the blurrier the image gets. Playing anything of consequence on this is a nightmare. Rainbow split shot eyes on these babies! Everybody just relax. I don't need to be reminded that the Game Boy also didn't have a backlit screen. I remember very well needing to buy custom lighting accessories to play my games in not perfectly lit situations. But the Game Boy came out in 1989. It was the best they could do at the time while keeping the price down. What is the Gamecom's excuse? They had eight years to figure out a cost-effective solution and improve the screen, but they didn't. In 1997, Seven, this was just embarrassing. It's safe to say the one big selling feature of the Gamecom was, well, the games. And it plays more games than you idiots have brain cells! That's great marketing. Let's insult the potential customers right from the get-go. Know what kids like? Being called stupid. And it plays more games than you idiots have brain cells! 100 billion. That's the number of brain cells in an average human. And it plays more games than you idiots have brain cells! 20. Over the Gamecom's three-year lifespan, they only released 20 games. Four of those 20 games are ports of exclusive Tiger properties. Lights Out, Henry, and Quiz Whiz were all Tiger handhelds before being ported to the Gamecom. Then there's also Tiger Casino, which is a collection of casino minigames. We'll talk about that in a sec. These releases are filler, just to pad out the launch library of the Gamecom. They're either games of random chance or repeating the same boring thing over and over. By the way, the Gamecom doesn't have video out or a properly lit screen, so to show you these games in the highest detail possible, we've recorded all of our footage using an emulator based on the same emulation and debug tools that developers working on Gamecom would have used back in 1997. Now, you might see a visual hit up every now and then, but you know what? It's way easier to look at this way than on a real Gamecom screen. Lights Out was the pack-in game for many Gamecom systems. The object of the game is to click the correct squares in the correct order to turn off all the lights on the board. Yes. It's as boring as it looks, but it actually uses the touchscreen relatively well. Some people say this is the best game on the console. And that should set your expectations right about here. Tiger Casino, which uses a T-Rex as a mascot for some reason, is probably the most pointless game on the console. It's just a bunch of boring games you play with virtual money that have absolutely no stakes, since the money is not real. Oh, and look, slot machines. I hate slot machines. You'll even find card games like High Card, Low Card, otherwise known as War. You click deal and see if your card is higher or lower, and it never changes. There is no strategy. And for six minutes, I played it expecting to see War, which is what happens when both cards match up. But it never got to War, which probably means they didn't program that in. Lazy. Then there's Henry. <laughs> A game of matching sounds. It's memory, but with sound effects. That That's really it. I find it hard to believe that teens that they were marketing the Gamecom to would have enjoyed spending $20 to play this game for hours on end, but... What do I know? Speaking of appealing to teens, here is the last of the Tiger original games, Quiz Whiz Cyber Trivia. It's a digital version of their at-home game simply called Quiz Whiz. Why would it appeal to high school kids though? That guy is cool. They tried to dress up a dry trivia game with a hip 90s dude that probably listened to Nirvana or something. This doesn't work. The over 1,500 questions are generic and uninteresting. Nothing can save this game, really. Not even the impressive sound capabilities that the Gamecom apparently has. Every time you answer a question, you'll get an animation like this. Yeah, that painful noise gets old real fast. If you're a true quiz whiz, you'll hear that sound a lot every time you get an answer right, because there aren't many other clips in rotation. It's all flash and no substance. Ugh. 
We're really not starting great, folks. The remaining 16 titles on Gamecom all use the name of some sort of known franchise or brand. Now, after all, how else would you get people to actually buy this thing? Now, let's keep the fun train rolling with releases based on TV game shows. It's every video game slacker's favorite programs, Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune. Both of these games are nowhere near as fun to play on Gamecom as how they look on TV. You'll struggle to enter your responses in Jeopardy using the on-screen keyboard, and in Wheel of Fortune, you'll always hit bankrupt on the wheel. At least I did, and I'm pretty sure it's because the game hates me. But it must have been well received because they actually released a Wheel of Fortune 2. It's basically the same game, but with different puzzles. Literally the least amount of effort they could have put in it at all. Let's leave behind the glamorous world of TV game shows and move to board games. You get two to choose from on Gamecom, Scrabble and Monopoly. Both of these games are poor and frustrating versions of their famous physical inspirations. They're more clunky than if you just took out the actual board game and played them that way. Scrabble is visually dry with little to no animations, but that is something that Monopoly can't help but show off. You feel more like a viewer than a participant. Despite the Gamecom marketing itself as an awesome new handheld system with unbelievable graphics, the games feel significantly less advanced and underpowered than original Game Boy games. Our next batch of Gamecom titles are perfect examples of this. Let me present the arcade ports. Centipede and Frogger, both standalone games, both very uninteresting. Oh, I, I like these games in their original arcade formats well enough, but they were over 15 year old games by the time they came out on Gamecom. By the way, both of these games have brand new and unique updated visual modes, exclusive to the Gamecom. Check this out. Whoa, Tilted Mushrooms. The next port is Williams Arcade Classics Collection. This collection appeared on all the major systems at the time, and even PC, but the worst version has to be on Gamecom. You got Defender, Defender 2, Joust, Sinistar, and Robotron. These are all the worst ports for these games I have ever played. The graphics and animations feel needlessly slow, like they're missing frames, and on original Gamecom hardware, they're very blurry and it's near impossible to see what's going on. The same collection on Super Nintendo is a night and day difference. The games actually function and are fun to play. And sure, it's a home console with more power, but the trade-off from console to handheld should still leave a playable game and not this irritating mess. Speaking of irritating messes, let's play Indy 500. This is the only racing game on the Gamecom, and you're about to find out why. This is a port of the 1995 Sega arcade game. Indy 500 got two home versions. The first one on the Tiger R Zone. Yeah, remember this? And the second one on the Gamecom. I can't believe how bad this game plays. It's a racing game with basically no view distance, so you're constantly hitting the sides of the road you're driving on. They couldn't even give you a mini-map so you could anticipate upcoming turns. So far, you might be asking yourself, But Shane, why should I care about any of these games? I've never heard of Henry, and I can play Centipede anywhere these days. And yeah, you're right. But you see, I had to lay down the foundation for what's gonna be happening next. Play more games and you idiots have brain cells! The Gamecom has proven it can't provide a decent platform for even the most basic gameplay experiences. But you see, they didn't stop with board games and long and tooth arcade titles. Oh no, there were Gamecom versions of modern titles. Titles like... <laughs> back, back, wait, I've got a plan. It's just... Batman and Robin. This is just a basic side-scrolling beat-em-up game. You start by choosing Batman or Robin as your hero. This time around, Batgirl isn't even a choice. You choose your weapons without any idea of what the level will require, and then you're into the action. The combat is so bad, like, so bad, you'll be tempted to just run past enemies as fast as you can to end the level. But then, you'll hit an invisible wall and not know why. Well, it's because beating up the baddies earlier on literally progresses you through the stage. If you skip past them, you cannot progress through the stage. And I really do want this to end, so I'll go back and fight. Wait, I can't go back? 
The game won't let me retreat to kill enemies I missed. It won't let me move forward to get to new enemies and isn't sending any into my new little tiny screen here. Uh, what am I gonna do? Are, are you kidding me? Am I actually stuck? Batman and Robin. It's bad on PlayStation, and shockingly, it's not much better on Gamecom. The next console port we have is Mortal Kombat Trilogy. Keeping with the Gamecom tradition, this is the worst way I've ever seen to play Mortal Kombat. It feels slow, glitchy, and awkward, and anticipating your opponent's next move is near impossible with these muddy graphics. Not to mention, this game really highlights how awful the jelly-filled D-pad is. It's a mess. And to make it worse, they remove some of the most used characters from this port. Sub-Zero, Scorpion, Liu Kang, and Sonya Blade are all missing from this game. That's like not having Ryu or Ken in Street Fighter. H how dare they? Oh sure, they included two unlockable characters, but why would you want to play this thing long enough to get that far? They managed to squeeze out one more fighting game, Fighters Mega Mix. It is, by the testimony of many a Saturn fan, one of the console's best fighting games. It's in full 3D. Gamecom is not capable of full 3D, so you get garbage like this instead. How does it play? Well, it feels like a button mashing frenzy trying desperately to land a hit. You'll just be flailing, hoping you accidentally win. This isn't even a single polygon close to what the original is like. Next is a movie tie-in game, The Lost World Jurassic Park. Hmm, I, I, I don't think they designed that logo right. I, I can't really read that. This is gonna be crap, isn't it? Yup, this sure is something. It's a hybrid game mixed with platforming and driving sequences. The driving sure sucks, with dinosaurs constantly hitting you from behind, which defeats the purpose of a four-word driving game. But how about that platforming? Well, making a jump from one ledge to another is so poorly designed that you'll fall. A lot. And surprise, you'll take fall damage. So you will die. A lot. The point of the game is to collect eggs, but if you play this enough, you'll lose your marbles. If only someone could have made a better platforming Lost World game. Well, they did! And on a system years older than the Gamecom. Meet the Game Gear release. Wonderful color graphics with great animations and pretty decent gameplay. If you put these games side by side, there is no way you would think the Gamecom was the newer system. But it totally is. So now we have three games left to talk about on Gamecom. And these last three are pretty special. Each one, in my opinion, was designed, developed, and released solely to cash in on much bigger and far more popular game franchises franchises of the time. But while the other games might have had a chance, these ones could never have worked. Let's start with the least offensive and work our way down, shall we? Resident Evil 2, the only officially published handheld version of this groundbreaking title. If I were them, I wouldn't go bragging about that though. First off, they removed half of the protagonists. RE2 is known for having two heroes, Leon and Claire. Well, for Gamecom, Claire is out and it's all about Leon. Off to a great start. The smooth gameplay design from other versions of this game is gone. You still have tank controls, but you're limited to just left, right, up, and down. It's a slog to play, and aiming your gun is so poorly controlled that you're forever missing what you're actually trying to kill. Instead, you're gonna be constantly shaking off Kalingi zombies. The best part of the game is the interface. Your map and inventory and files, it's all just like the original game, but because of how small the screen is, it can be a little bit difficult to get through especially when trying to organize everything. It would be easy to point to the original PlayStation game to show how bad a port this is, but I don't have to do that. Enter Resident Evil 2 on Nintendo 64, an N64 cartridge that had one-tenth the capacity of a single PlayStation disc, yet was still capable of playing this full game. You had all the characters and full motion cutscenes. That was a technical marvel for the time. Resident Evil 2 on Gamecom is a technical disappointment. They couldn't even keep the narrative in the game. You start with a brief explanation that Umbrella made a toxin that turned everyone to zombies, but that's kind of it. Interactions with other characters in the game, like the store owner at the start and the injured officer at the police station, are completely gone. The game doesn't tell you who you are or what you're doing in this city shooting zombies. You'll need to have played this somewhere else to actually have any idea what's going on. The gameplay doesn't paint an engrossing world for you to get lost in anywhere near the same way that Resident Evil 2 
2 on Intel 64 PlayStation 1 does. This game is a straight up biohazard. Our second to last game is Duke Nukem 3D. This game was used heavily in Gamecom's marketing to highlight the console's amazing speech capabilities. Let's rock. Sure, it speaks, but so what? I didn't get this to have a conversation, I got it to play games. It plays more games than you idiots have brain cells! I feel like playing these games is killing my brain cells. In Duke Nukem 3D on the Gamecom, you can't turn around. Let me say that again, you cannot turn in this game. You walk forward, step backwards, strafe to the left and right, but that's it. I'm not kidding. The free-flowing movement you've come to expect from the original Duke Nukem 3D is completely gone. There are tight corridors with turns that force you to go left and right when needed, and it's disorienting. Finding your way around levels is confusing because you always feel like you're going forward, even when you're not. Enemies come out of the darkness as if appearing from nothing. What made the original game so good, in fact, what made any first-person shooter so good, was that you could see an enemy from far away, giving you targets to shoot at even at a distance. This can happen here because if you move just a few steps out of range, an enemy just doesn't show up. Now, Duke 3D is a first-person shooter, so of course, you've got weapons. I'm not sure why they did it, but now the weapons are harder to use. In any FPS game of the era, you just aim and fire. Usually firing is just, well, one button. But the Gamecom folks thought, hey, why not make three buttons work as fire buttons? Oh. You heard that right. Two of the face buttons slightly aim your weapon to the left and right and fire, while a third button fires straight and true. You know why they did that? Because you can't turn in the game. Duke Nukem on Gamecom is so far removed from the original game that it's not even from the same planet. And I don't want the excuse that handheld games need to sacrifice for the smaller format. Game developers found multiple ways to get full experiences on portable systems. For example, Duke Nukem on Game Boy Color is one of them. The cover features the same cover art for the original Duke Nukem 3D, but the game inside is the 2D side-scrolling style of Duke Nukem 1 and 2. Knowing their limitations in porting 3D games to the Game Boy, they instead took the new image of Duke, shades and all, and put him in a remake of the second game originally released on DOS. It was a genius way to get a modern IP on a handheld system. Now, for the final game on this miserable system, I present to you Sonic Jam. Oh, Sonic, my boy. Well, what have they done to you? Well, right away, I noticed the game is missing from this collection. Sonic Jam on Saturn includes all three of the original Sonic the Hedgehog games and Sonic and & Knuckles. The Gamecom version is missing the first Sonic game. Not really a great start, but let's see how Sonic 2 plays. Oh, this is slow. Like crazy slow. Uh, the one thing you need to get right in the port of Sonic the Hedgehog is the speed. He was going fast in the commercial, but what happened? Tiger, you wouldn't have faked gameplay for an ad, would you? Because I think you did. Without a doubt, this is the worst officially licensed Sonic game I have ever played. The gameplay just sucks. Sonic can't even get up this incline properly. What is happening here? The music is also all wrong, playing tracks during the wrong levels. You can't pick up your rings after you get hurt. And sure, you can play as Knuckles, but he plays the same as Sonic. They took away his gliding and climbing abilities. What's the point of being Knuckles if you can't do those things? Tails can still fly, but his power is completely unchecked. They didn't even design the levels with flight in mind, so between no obstacles and Tails' overpowered flight ability, you can easily just fly over these levels and just get to the end. It's crazy. There had already been multiple traditional Sonic games on Sega's handheld system, the Game Gear, and these came out years before the Gamecom. The Game Gear Sonic titles aren't exactly like their Genesis siblings, but they're pretty solid nonetheless. They're fast, they're fun, and they get the job done. The Gamecom's inability to replicate the fun gameplay of the Game Gear just goes to show that Gamecom never really had a chance. And again, when putting these side by side, it's crazy to think that Sonic Sonic the Hedgehog on the Game Gear is seven years older than Sonic Jam on Gamecom. They should feel ashamed. 
Tiger was clearly not up to the expectations of the handheld game market in the late 90s. The hardware is cheap and filled with useless features, Tiger's original games on offer were horrible, and the games ported to the system were even worse pathetic shadows of games from previous consoles. The Gamecom hung on for a few years, releasing a couple revisions of the hardware that were smaller and cheaper. One of the revisions even added a lit screen, which arguably would make the console easier to play, but who cares? When the only games you could play were these, the Gamecom was officially not worth playing and officially discontinued in 2000. So that's the Gamecom. If there's one silver lining to this story, it's that Gamecom can be a tale of caution for companies to follow. Come to market with solid hardware. Don't rely on flimsy gimmicks, and above all else, games are king. Wherever you are, Stadia lets you play the latest games. They learned nothing. Ha <laughs> ha